Hey there, Kids Cook Real Food. Katie Kimball here for the Healthy Parenting Connector, where we strive to connect parents who really want to raise healthy kids with the experts who have the information they need. And today, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Mary Ann Jacobson. Thanks for being here, Mary Ann. Thanks for having me, Katie. Yeah, so Mary Ann is a registered dietitian who ended up following her dream of becoming a writer and became a go-to expert for everything from Huffington Post to WebMD, parents, and even Good Morning America. She's kind of that person that people kept saying, like, do you know Mary Ann Jacobson? When are you going to interview her? So, and, and then every time I read one of her blog posts on her Raised Healthy Eaters site, I'm like, oh, everyone needs to know this. I have to share it. And, and it's, I'm always right. People always love her stuff. So it's super exciting to me. We finally were able to connect, and I was honored to be on her Healthy Family podcast. So definitely go listen to that. Download that to your phone. Um, and I'm excited to share her wisdom with you today. She's built up a ton of experience as a family nutrition expert. And her mission is to prevent unhealthy attitudes toward food and people's bodies. She's written a bunch of books, no sponsors, very important to her, to uh -huh. achieve that goal. But her most important job is mothering two children who happen to have taught her a great deal about uh -huh. food and eating styles. Yeah? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so let's jump right in. Like, What got you interested in your life in nutrition as a field of study? And how did you end up narrowing that focus on food attitudes? Well, I got, um, I was always really active growing up. I played softball and um, sports and cheer, but I never thought about what I ate <laughs> for health reasons until I graduated high school and I joined a gym and from working out, then I started, my sister was getting into healthy eating and I just really totally revamped the way I ate, added a lot more fruits and vegetables. Um, this was a low fat day, so low fat, as low as you could go, <laughs> but um and I just like, wow, this makes me feel good. I never made that connection between food and how you feel. And so when it was time to major in college, it was like, it was either going to be physical education, because I always loved that, uh, or nutrition. And I just thought there were a lot more job opportunities with nutrition and thought I'd try. And if I, you know, I tried a semester and I really liked all the classes. So, um, so yeah, that's what got me into nutrition. But once I started working, you know, I've had many, many jobs. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do uh -huh. um, until uh, actually I, I had a job. I had to write for my job and it was like, wow, I want to write. I want to help people by, you know, writing about nutrition and, and health. So that's uh, how I, I kind of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love how you kind of stumbled into these things. I think it probably gives great hope to parents hearing that someone like just out of high school can get into, you know, caring for her own health. So that's great. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that you pursued that and just like, just sort of were, was able to follow your passions as you discovered them is super cool and super inspiring. So then what in your work brought home this idea of attitudes about food and how important that is? Yeah, so even though I loved nutrition, I still struggled. I, I didn't know mm -hmm. how to eat foods like cookies and cake. And so I, I wasn't, I didn't know moderation. I thought oh, I'm just addicted like everyone else. And so I still struggled until um, I did my internship and I went to New Orleans. And anyone who's been to New Orleans know there's a lot of food, <laughs> a right. lot of beignets, fried food, um, standing room only fried chicken. And I'm from California. So I was like, this is different. And I was really, I was very afraid of food. I was fat phobic, you know, like how we can get now with carbs and there's just something about that time. I was also, I always wanted to leave my hometown. And that was something deep inside of me that when I first went to college and in my hometown, it's like, I need to leave. And it took me seven years until I did this internship. I went to New Orleans and I think I was happy. I was excited. And so I didn't really look at food the same way because I think I would use food to, you know, if I wasn't happy, I'd eat. And um, mm. so this 10 months, I really, I learned like I had, I could have one or two beignets and be satisfied. And I ate regular meals at the hospital. I didn't snap, like I used to just, you know, graze all day. And I don't know, I just started listening to my body. And, and I, when I came back to my hometown, I thought, well, wow, I'm different. My sister baked cookies. I can have a couple and be satisfied. Before I would be like, I'd eat until they were gone. Mm. So I knew some, I knew something happened and I didn't read a book or anything. I, 
So I started, you know, as I got back working as a dietitian, I started researching why, what, how did this develop? Why did I have an unhealthy relationship with food? And I started to kind of build the pieces through the years, through research. You know, I grew up in a big family and food was, if it came in, it was gone. I had two older brothers that were like, we always fought about food. Like if there were ice cream, it would be, there's no way you'd have to eat it before my brothers would. <laughs> eat it or lose it. Sure. Yeah. And so that built your habits of yeah. necessity. Yeah. Yeah. And we didn't have structured meals. We, you know, this was a, the seventies. We ate in front of the TV. We kind of mindless eating. So I kind of had these habits. And then when I learned about nutrition, that was good. But what was missing was the healthy relationship with food. And so that internship really was kind of a turning point. And then I came back working as a dietitian counseling people. And I was trying to get these messages, but they were still like, give me the diet. You know, um, mm, they were under, people you know, didn't understand how to how thinking was impactful for them. Yeah. And I didn't really know how to help them either. So, um, yeah, so it just kind of started me researching and, you know, it, it took many years to where I am now to kind of, you know, understand. I feel like I have a much more good understanding of health healthy habits. It's not just about what to eat. It's sure. Um, and how we yeah, and this, mm -hmm. this is why you're an expert because you were able to reverse engineer your own experience. So you know what it feels to be in it. And I think a lot of families will reflect what your experience is. Eating is a little bit mindless. There's way more screens now <laughs> than there oh, were yeah. in the seventies. And, you know, I don't think we're really taught in many places other than venues like this about mindfulness with food. So it's really important. And you're definitely an expert. So tell mm -hmm. us how you define a healthy relationship with food now. Well, a healthy relationship with food, there's, you know, a variety of uh, different aspects, but it's, you know, it's listening to your body, hunger, you know, hunger and fullness, help you just guide your eating. Um, it's, you know, seeking nutritious foods because they make you feel good, not because you have to, or it's a guilty mm -hmm. Um, it's separating food from your emotions. I mean, we all will emotionally eat once in a while. That's, but when we, we start using food to deal, to manage difficult emotions, that's unhealthy. So it's kind of separating food and, and dealing with emotions on an emotional, you know, not with food. Um, right. and it's, you know, reg, I think you know, regulating your intake, getting about enough, you know, food that your body needs. And, um, and you do that by listening to it and, and, you know, getting sleep and how you deal with stress. So it's not just about the food. It's it's all these different factors that that affect it. So sometimes a, a parent will come to me and say, oh, my gosh, my my son or, or daughter just eat so much, you know, and they won't stop. So I have to cut them off. And I'm like, well, what else is so they are they were like, oh, I, carbs are bad. And it's like, well, what else is going on? Are they mm -hmm. having stress at school? Are they getting sleep? Uh, you know, so in my book, How to Raise a Mindful Eater, I, I talk about these eight principles for helping children develop a healthy relationship with food. And we really need to think not just, we go straight to food when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. We need to look at what's contributing. The eating is an outcome. So when we go straight to food, we're actually going to the outcome instead of mm -hmm. what's causing it, um, which sometimes it is food related. And food is always a part of, you know, um, what you eat matters, you know, a great deal. But um so yeah, a healthy relationship with food yeah has all these different, you know, it's also being happy and feeling good about your life, you know, and um, because a lot of times, like I said, with my internship, I was finally listening to that voice and doing what mm -hmm. I wanted to do. And it, um, a lot, food is just everywhere. So it's something really easy that we can just, you know, eat because we're not feeling good or um, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's so many impacts on our eating that are psychological, emotional, as you said. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a healthy relationship with food is really just one piece of the puzzle of a healthy relationship with one's body and oneself. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all like, yeah, it's all related, you know, um, how we feel. If we don't feel good about our body, you know, and that doesn't mean we love how it looks at a bathing suit. But if, we're, if we don't not in tune with our body, it's going to be harder to eat well and to have a healthy relationship with food. Um, I think Absolutely. that's something, yeah, that's really missing in how we talk to kids about um, how they kind of tune in to their mm. to their body and how how it feels. Sure thing, and it's such a noisy world. There's so much external stimulation coming at our brains that I think it's really difficult, even when you're trying to think about it, 
to pay attention to your body and be cognizant enough to think like, well, I ate X and I feel Y and I didn't eat X yesterday. You know, like it's, it can mm -hmm. be like some thinking, but even just being mindful at all about why am I eating mm -hmm. is a great start. Um, in your book, you just mentioned how to raise a mindful eater. You talk about moderation a lot. And I feel like that's one of these like inflammatory terms that I feel a lot of parents overuse. So I would love to hear you speak about what Americans misunderstand about moderation. Well, I, th I see moderation being used kind of as an excuse. So like someone will be like, you know, their third piece third bowl of ice cream be like everything in moderation you know and it um, is doesn't it it drives me crazy everything in moderation gives yeah. us sugar the problem is though it's because we feel guilty about eating the ice cream that causes it so it's not necessarily people's fault um one of the key aspects um for eating moderately is giving yourself permission to eat all foods because if we don't then we may become preoccupied with like how I used to be. I didn't know how to eat them. So, you know, ice cream and, and I like sweets. So I just try to cut them out as long as I could, then I would overeat them. But once mm -hmm. I allowed them into my, my diet and thought about how does it make me feel? How much do I really want? I never asked myself, like, what is it that I want? You know, we're afraid that if we eat what we want, it's going to be all you know, um, sugar and stuff. But once I allowed myself, then those foods became less, of a big deal and um like in our house we have a sweet area and my kids know you know when they want something sweet they go there and it's it's usually after dinner but it may be in the afternoon usually you know once a day and they decide how much and they're we don't eat it at every meal it's they become very good at you know seeing how those foods fit into their diet and we know that you know if you're active and um, you eat well, that, that we have room for, for those foods. So I think um, moderation is, the problem is that a parent might be like, okay, here's two cookies, that's moderation. But moderation is an outcome, it's not something you do. So if you're listening to Hunger and Fullness and you're, you have regular structured meals, you're naturally gonna probably eat in moderation. That doesn't mean that you're always, if you haven't had cookies in a super long time, you may wanna eat more than two, you know? That mm -hmm. kind of, that kind of makes sense. Like if you, you know, sometimes I haven't baked cookies in a long time, my kids, they'll have a lot. And then the next time they'll have a little, you know, so we have to yeah. consider that, you know, um, it's not always about eating the same amount, especially with kids because kids are growing and they can be go, going through a growth spurt and they eat a lot. So the key is really, you know, listening to hunger and fullness. Um, what we think is moderation for us may, may be different for them because they're, yeah you know, they're not little adults. They have very different um, nutrition needs. They're still growing, their brain's developing. Um, so, mm -hmm. so yeah. So moderation, I mean, yeah, it's not a set of numerical equations. Yeah. It's more of an eating philosophy and really over a broader span of time, maybe than one meal or one day. Yeah. 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 And I think, um, and kids regulate a little different than we do. Um, like they may eat a lot, you know, at dinner, and then they don't eat as much, you know, the way they regulate is not at every meal. Um, mm -hmm. They may eat less in the morning. And so you think, wow, they ate a lot at dinner, but then you notice they didn't eat much at, at, at breakfast. And so, I mean, especially when they're younger, when they get a little bit older, um, when they go through puberty, then they're really hungry all the time. But um, so, yeah, yeah I've I got one who's <laughs> about 14 and he's been eating, I mean, frozen fruit after dinner, like when he's doing his homework, which I'm not complaining, mm -hmm. like what a great after dinner treat but he'll take like the big cereal bowl and fill it up mm -hmm. so the rest of the family's like dude like we're gonna run out before mom goes to costco next mm -hmm. so it is tricky not to make it an equation because i want to say i mean i've said to him what well, your dad and i when we have frozen fruit like we use like the little bowl we're bigger mm -hmm. than you you should use the little bowl and like so just hearing you talk i'm like oh like i just need to open a discussion with him like how hungry are you mm -hmm. if you're listening to your body this is you know what you can eat but let's talk about how often mom goes to costco <laughs> and make sure that this fits yeah and they can do a hunger scale in my new book that's coming out hopefully the end of this month my body mm -hmm. superpower it's for girls going through puberty you know there's a hunger scale so you can teach them like from one to five where they think they are you know um, cool. if there are three they can think about you know when we go get frozen yogurt you know how it's weighed and it can be huge Instead of limiting them, like a lot of parents be like, only take this much. I say, how hungry are you? Let's let's tune into your bellies. Okay. And then, you know, and then they, you know, sometimes they still get it wrong and we have to save 
um, save some of the yogurt, but you know, my kids have gotten really good if, if they're full, they're full and they, they stop. And, um, that's really kind of what moderation is not something that imp like you feel self control. You do because it's, you like it, you, you prefer it mm -hmm. just like, um, you know, you don't want to eat a whole bunch of cookies because you know how that makes you feel. And so right. um, it's like teaching it, your brain to listen to the you in half an hour from now. Like, yeah. what does me half an hour from now want to feel? Yeah, yeah time travel. That's in my book. Like, you know, oh, teaching nice. kids, how, how are you going to feel in a few hours with food, but other stuff, right? Like doing their homework and because um, they have a hard time. They're so focused on now. They, mm -hmm. they, you know, but it's good for them to start learning that kind of self-control that if they hold out, they get a bigger reward later. Um, yeah. And I think research shows that kids who can do that are more successful in all areas of life, right? Yeah. It's called the delayed younger, discounting. Better. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, you know, some kids are kind of naturally at it, better at it younger, but it's, you know, it's something kids learn. And another really important part with food is to have that, that structure having eating tables, eating tables, <laughs> eating meals at the table, you know, at certain times and not eating between meals. So, you know, um, in, in my first book, Fearless Feeding, I think we say that, you know, if they're really hungry, they can always have fruit and you have fruit out and, you know, um, so that's kind of one way to, to get around hungry kids. But my kids have been doing this forever. It's very rare that between meals or snack that they're like, I want food. Mm -hmm. How um, old so are they now? Just to give us some context. They're, they're 10 and 12. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're yeah. kind of like right in the middle of the parenting game. <laughs> yeah, the transition. Um so yeah, I think you know, unlike how I grew up where it was just whenever you feel like it you get food and you know, mm -hmm. at night that was a big thing was just always with the TV I had to eat. That took a um the internship helped because after that I kind of that habit was gone. Um, you had to separate yourself from maybe your family and your home to start to break some of those habits. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't get food in my, <laughs> in my dorm. So I, I ate all my meals at the hospital and it was, you know, great. It was like free food and they had, uh, you know, salad bar and um, gumbo, you know, all these, you know, um, foods from New Orleans that were, that I learned about. But um, yeah, it just, then I learned, you know, I just kind of got out of that broke that yeah. kind of association because you know I think a lot of kids I think and I'd have to look up this study but you know a lot of kids just with snacks everywhere they associate certain activities with eating instead oh, of sure. you know hunger um especially with the sports games you know where the parents oh yeah snacks and, um so yeah that structured meals at the table that helps you be more mindful and helps you get in a rhythm and you know that's how I yeah, am. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, no, very, very practical. So you just mm -hmm. mentioned your first book, Fearless Feeding. And and can you kind of just jump from stage to stage for us and give parents a super quick tip based on the age of their kid, like a toddler, an elementary and a middle school, like foundational thing that they should do to, to start these good habits? Yeah, well, let's start with infancy because that's okay. so the, the first a thousand days, actually, when you conceive is so important for nutrition. And, um, and so, you know, <clears throat> making sure that, you know, your nutrition when you're pregnant is, is adequate. Um, and also when the baby's born, you know, if you can breastfeed, but one of the key things is responsive feeding. So even, um, when you start, even when you're just giving the bottle or breastfeeding, you're, you're looking for those signs of hunger and fullness, they're turning their head. You don't always want them to finish the bottle. A lot of experts mm -hmm. think that, um, eating issues can start in infancy. Um, and so you, you want to be responsive even then to hunger and fullness. And wow. that's why, you yeah, know, we've baby, talked about, yeah, we yeah. talked about how it's not a numbers game, but when it, when you're doing the bottle, it's totally a numbers game. Yeah. Not only that, um, sometimes when kids wake it or babies wake at night, they really just need to be held. Sometimes right away we go with the food. So it's, you know, um, if you feel like it has, it's been a while, they may not be hungry first, just try and soothe them or, so that's called responsive parenting. You're responding appropriately to your baby instead of just running in with food, um, even if it's breast milk. I mean, you know, they're less likely to, you know, to get too much breast milk, but um, they still can if it's always something they're upset, they get food, you know, so you want to try and respond to them appropriately. Um, and in fearless feeding, we talk about all the nutrition, you know, iron is really important. 
Um, so is DHA for brain development. Um, so, you know, babies typically eat most everything and it's a great time to get that variety. Um, mm -hmm. you know, even vegetables that, that are bitter tasting, they'll make a funny face, but they'll still eat them. And research shows the more they get in infancy increases the likelihood that they'll eat veg vegetables later. Um, but then around toddlerhood, around 18 months to two and a half years, they become picky. They stop growing so fast. So that critical nutrition period ends and they, they're not interested in food. They start um, rejecting foods. And this really is an important time. The relationship with food can get off. Then it's like you have to eat two more bites. And then we get this uh, negativity around eating. And kids feel, they grow up thinking, I'm not that good. You know, I, my parent has to tell me what to do. So this is when the division of responsibility, Ellen Satter, is really important where you set up the structure, you decide what to eat, and then just let your toddler decide whether and how much. Um, some meals they won't eat, they're just not going to be hungry. And they don't really need that much. And um, what matters most is their growth. And you take them to the doctor, and the doctor will tell you um, how they're growing. They're not always going to eat. You know, some meals they'll want to have, you know, two, three servings, other meals, not so much. So, right. um, so that really, you know, parents need to be careful and not start micromanaging and getting the battles because that can really affect kids' um, relationship yeah. with food. Uh, so after toddlerhood, then school age, and it's all those influences, right? It's all the snacks. All of a sudden you had all this control and they go out to school and, you know, who knows it's what. It's kind of devastating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's where I think really teaching them how to eat the sweets, how, you know, um, how food affects their body, um, helping them to make good decisions. And when they don't, not to freak out, um, you know, that's how they learn if they get sick from eating too much. And because you still, you know, most of the food is still at home. You're still the primary, um, you know, you have the most influence than that these outside so to kind of consider it a learning they're just learning how um how to eat and you know one time in kindergarten there's all this food it's like you know someone would come in give a talk and it's like they have cookies and it's like what you know they felt like these kindergartners always needed food and i started this thing with my daughter i'm like just bring it home don't eat it there and bring it home and we'll decide and so she started bringing mm. the food home and we decided how it fit in some we give away and um, so I think it, it, you can feel powerless, but really, you know, this is a real world. And so um, it, they ended up stopping the food at the school not too long Yay. after that. <laughs> food, <laughs> food allergies, though, but whatever. Um, so and it even, yeah, it can happen even in like middle school. There's, oh, yeah. you know, they can reward with food and all that. But um, so I think that's a watch out. That's when the sweets and um, most mm -hmm. kids start to branch out a little bit with food in the school age years. And then um, then they hit puberty. Girls are two years before boys, around 10 and 11 for girls. Boys are like 11, 12 that they start. And that's when they get really hungry. And it can, um, you know, they may not always want healthy food because you have to understand they're growing. This is the second fastest growth spurt behind infancy. Mm -hmm. They want satisfying foods. And sometimes you can, you know, they want they ask for, let's go out to eat. They want um, fast food and um, not all kids, but they want satisfying food. They're hungry. So this mm -hmm. is a good time, Katie, you bring them in the kitchen. They should, if they are not already in the kitchen and have mm -hmm. them, they need the independence too. So go, that's yeah. really important for their development. So let's, you know, if you don't like what I'm cooking, let's, let's experiment and try different things. Um, teaching them, and it's a great time to teach them about what they need in nutrition. I do that in my book, talk about how it affects how they feel. And, and by now they're having things, they, they usually have activities, you know, maybe they picked a sport they love or they're, you know, something mm -hmm. they love, and tying what they eat and they're, you know, um, into how it's going to make their life better. So sure. we want to we internally motivate our kids. We can't just don't tell them don't eat that or eat this. That, that doesn't work. It, research shows with these kids, they may have high nutrition knowledge. That doesn't really affect their eating habits. They still want satisfaction. They want to be satisfied. And so we have to make sure that that's, that's part of the equation. But then they also, you know, they start developing more a sense of them, themselves, their identity, mm -hmm. finding things they like to do. Um, so it really is an important time to get more independence and, uh, you know, be more of a coach. You know, if 
Mm -hmm. You can't just tell them what to do. That just stops working. Um, So, um, yeah, and and understanding, too, what their nutrition needs are. Their bones are growing. They need calcium. It's really a time they don't eat very. All the research shows their eating goes down, but their needs go up. So it's, you know. Uh Uh-huh. It's tricky. Um, Yeah, but I like using what they love. So, you know, this type of food, these categories will help you run faster and build muscle better. And these types will, right, like help you think better to recognize your drama lines. Yeah, because Mm. let them figure that out too. So, you know, if they had a, because sometimes we can oversell. And I know I used to see this. Some parents would be like, you're going to grow if you eat that. And that, and then they see, wait, I didn't grow. So have them, if they had a, a practice that wasn't that great, like, well, what did you eat? What do you think? You know, try to have them figure it out. Um, yeah, that's awesome. And, and it may take time. But another thing that's really vital is, is body image because um, both boys and girls gain weight, but girls gain a lot of fat to prepare for their mm-hmm. menstrual periods. And they, they gain fat around the middle before, you know, they grow kind of out of proportion and I don't know how many parents have come to me like, oh, my, my daughter has a weight problem. And I'm like, she doesn't have a weight problem. She's going through puberty. She needs to know this is normal. She needs, you know, um, you need to make sure, you know, the structure and meals and hunger and fullness that they understand what that is. Because sometimes they can. They're so hungry or they feel bad mm-hmm. for being hungry. They try not to eat. And then they, you know, again, that that's something that really is not helpful at any stage the resist and the overindulge yeah so we got to do the whole media and and my book outlines all of this for girls and then i'm eventually do one for boys as well um these media images that show very something very different and there's something today that researchers call weight misperception and it's um, a lot of um girls think that they're overweight when they're not and i don't really like to use i don't like the bmi categories but in general, they, they just, they feel like they're fat and, mm-hmm. and, and, and all the research points towards, if you have a positive body image, you're going to be healthy. You're going to have healthier habits. You're going to eat better. You're going to exercise. You're going to sleep. You're going to have better emotional health. When you have a poor body image, um, you're going to more likely to diet, not eat as well, not exercise. It's very demotivating. So body image is actually a major health issue. Mm-hmm. And, and we, and, and this is the, you know, 50% of girls, um, I think between nine and 14 don't like their bodies. And I think, I think a big part of it's just say, they just don't know what's going on. And I have these talks all the time with my daughter and I know I want other families to talk more because we're Mm -hmm. told don't talk about weight, but no, they need to know what's happening to their bodies. They, um, they're gaining a lot of weight between sometimes between 10 and 20 pounds in a year and their mm. peak growth. And that's a huge difference from what they're used to. Then they're also worried about, they're very sensitive. They're, they're um, starting to have crushes and all that. They're, you know. Um, Terrible timing on all that. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> all this, right. Yeah, so, um, you know, we can do all this stuff to help our kids with nutrition and health. And then we kind of, I think, as a society, this body image, we just don't know what to do. And then we have these articles that like, don't mention your weight. No, that's just like skimming the, the top there. You know, kids need to develop a strong sense of self. They need to understand what's going on with their body. Um, they need to understand their emotions and what their emotions are telling them. They need to develop good friendships. And then, you know, that's important for body image too. having um, connections that are positive. That doesn't mean there's ups and downs, which of course there are. Um, so it's all really important, um, you know. For their- sure. So the culture is kind of saying, stay on the surface. Don't ever let your kids hear you say, oh, I'm fat or oh, mm-hmm. I'm ugly, right? Like that's really common pop yeah. culture advice. And you're saying, no, like peel that right off. We have to dig in deep. We need to talk to our kids about A, what's normal, that many sizes and shapes of bodies can be mm-hmm. normal. Ask them how they're feeling about their body. Like don't be afraid of it or else our kids will be too. And then that becomes the cause of, overeating and maybe even depression and or under eating or getting an eating disorder it puts you at sure risk. um so yeah and i think if you've had trouble you know like i dieted in in high school and lost weight so i talk about that with my daughter i don't want that for you this is what i went through i didn't know these things mm. um so a lot of times we want to just keep it you know i'll just won't talk about me 
Um, and if, if you are, you know, a mom that, and you have, you don't love your body or you have, you know, you have some work in this area, you can, you can improve upon that. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, different books out there, programs. Uh, and I think a lot of it's just sh shifting our perspective of how we look at mm -hmm. our body from appreciating for it, for what it can do, instead of just treat, you know, looking at it as, uh, you know, an object, you know, it's supposed mm -hmm. to look a certain way. And, um, and that's what we, we try and do with our kids is appreciate your body. I mean, every day, you know, what is something about your body? We're watching the switched at birth show, <laughs> me and my daughter. Okay. And, um, and uh, so one of the girls is deaf and it's like, well, you appreciate your hearing, right? I mean, that's something, you know, my daughter can mm -hmm. sing your voice, you know, um, even I think Allie Raisman, the Olympic, she wrote on her Instagram um, account that she was made fun of because she had these, her arms were really muscular oh. and all these boys made fun of her. And she's like one of the best gymnasts in the world now. So wow. you don't, you don't know how your body keep it healthy and strong and you don't know how it's going to help you in some way in the future and it's being thin is just not that's culture's idea but let's yeah. challenge that idea that we're all supposed to look the same and isn't that kind of boring and um right well so, and yeah if our yeah. bodies naturally put on weight as female bodies naturally put mm -hmm. on weight before puberty that's pretty much saying that if we are designed to have children which is a beautiful thing that our bodies can do that we can you know, that we need that little extra weight and that that can, that should be a beautiful thing too. So I yeah. think, yeah, kids can really make us better people. If that's, it's a good motivation to improve our own body image. Yeah. While talking about it with, especially our daughters, but our sons too. I love that. This is, this is so important because I didn't even, I know a lot about nutrition. Like mm -hmm. I geek out on that stuff. And when you said like girls gain that extra weight before puberty, I was like, Oh my gosh, like scratching that into my brain because I have a 10 year old yeah. daughter. I didn't really know that. So, like, we got to shout this to the world. Girls need to know this. Well, they grow the, around average of four years, but they, um, mm -hmm. so they gain initial fat, but then it is redistributed to different areas to give them more curves. So, unlike boys who don't, they go, their puberty is longer, it's like six years, their mm -hmm. fastest growth is at the end. So, boys have the opposite problem. They worry they're too small. And um, mm -hmm. that, that puts them at risk versus a girl that develops early is at risk for um, eating issues and body image mm -hmm. issues. Um, so they both have, you know, boys, I mean, they're, they're not that far behind girls and not feeling mm -hmm. great about their body. Um, right. And, and they get kind of out of proportion in other ways, like their limbs kind of generally go out of proportion and then get redistributed. Yeah. And they tend to kind of grow all at once where girls gain the fat and then they then it's redistributing. And then they you know, there's they're growing up. It's not like they're not. But then mm -hmm. they grow. Um, and so they need to know that that they're in this kind of transition phase and um, they can't control that. And if they try mm -hmm. and control it, that's something that's not a good use of their time. It's not one of their superpowers, as I talk about. But, um, what a great so, title for that book. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, a girl actually named it. I had readers read it mm -hmm. and she came up with the idea and I'm like, oh, you know, I think that's awesome. I, yeah. You know, um, so, that's yeah, it's one of my, cool. my passion, you know, projects for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of your advice really revolves around training our children, building mm -hmm. them up and giving them the skills. And, and another one of your books from picking to powerful has the word empower in mm -hmm. the subtitle. And I'd love to hear you unpack that a little bit. How does it work to empower your picky eater? Well, so many kids, we don't realize it they don't come out and say it, but they don't really feel good about their eating because, mm -hmm. you know, let's say you the picky eater and everyone says, yeah, he's my picky eater. <laughs> and um, this picky eater has all these, there's some great things about being a picky eater. Usually they're cautious kids and that's not bad, right? Cautious kids watch before they cross the street, you know? Um, they also tend to listen. They're full, they're full, you know? Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, they're just, there was this one, I quote him in the book. He He was really picky at 12 and now he's a restaurant owner and he loves food. Like they, some picky eaters actually, they taste, they have stronger taste. So like sure. I, my daughter, I, I wouldn't call picky, but she's just definitely knows what she likes. I'm like, you're going to be a foodie someday. And you're, you know, you can already be one now, you know, we're working on it. But um, she just really like she, if it's stale, she doesn't want it. Like and, you know, only fresh fruit that's, you know, so I think we have to change the way we look at, um, whatever our, our child has, like we have this, these preconceived ideas of how we're going to raise them with food. 
then we have our kid and, and they just have these certain inclinations and I think we're better off working with their natural strengths mm -hmm. and not taking these weaknesses and making them you know if you have a cautious eater you know all these books say you know make them adventurous I just don't think you you're gonna do that that doesn't mean they can't learn to like food they're just gonna do it in their own way they mm -hmm. like my son is really likes you know he wants he likes the gardening he likes when when he's cooking he'll taste stuff more my daughter doesn't but she's creative and she loves creating so we come up with a great she came up with this guacamole she's like I'm our you know your guacamole is boring I'm like okay I guess you know I make it because it's fast so she found this recipe and um, thanks to you because we've been doing your classes and um, it has all this chunks of tomatoes and onions. I, and I was really surprised, but she loves it. And now if we have time, we make it. And um, so I know with her, that's that creativity. And I know someday she's gonna be an awesome cook, that way better than me. But if I just focus on the fact that it's, it's a pain sometimes, her, you know, how she's very particular, but let's turn that into a strength. And my son's cautious, but you know, he adds food slowly in his own way. Mm -hmm. um, and he's really, he's very good at regulating his intake. If he doesn't want dessert, no, you know, he's just very matter of fact. Sure, um, and a lot of parents would love to have a yeah. child with some of those regulations. So yeah, yeah the focus so thing think, on the strength is so important. Yeah, so empowering is knowing that for most kids, 50% um, complain of picky eating, especially not between two and six is kind of the yeah. um, food phobic, you know, um, it drives parents so, crazy between two yeah. and six. Yeah, they all think they've failed. Yeah, and then they, and, yeah. you know, this advice is about changing your picky eater, and we really just need to change, like, this is a normal part of development. Yes, there's things we can do to help them, but we, there's no guarantees, there's no formula. Um, I think, you know, all the research shows that exposure, getting them in the kitchen, you know, get those hands-on experience. You know, we're focused so much on what we can't control, trying to make them eat versus all the circumstances that help them become better eaters. So I'd rather focus on things I can control. Um, and I always know it when I'm unhappy, I'm focusing on things I can't, you know, nope, let's get, let's get in the kitchen. Let's, you know, I'm going to try new recipes. I'm, you know, um, so yeah, and we empower our eaters by having them not know that they're picky. Don't call them picky. Um, you know, have them enjoy food. They, it should be enjoyable. They shouldn't be worried when they're going to the dinner table. What am I going to have to eat? Mm. Um, or if it's the opposite problem, they, maybe they eat too much and they're always cut off and they, you know, so, mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah I mean, so we need to put you know. some power in their, in their boat and mm -hmm. allow them to see their strengths as well. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's really and important. I wrote an article about that and some of the advantages to having a pick eater. And, cool. um, <laughs> is that yeah. on your blog? You know, it's actually on the parents.com. I can send it to you if you want to. Okay. Oh, yeah. We'd it. love to link yeah. to it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, well, Marianne, I love to leave parents with a message of hope. And one thing I've loved about this whole conversation is that you have, have really focused on the positive so much. But just kind of closing words, if you could really encourage parents in one way or with a story of success, what do you want people to walk away remembering? You know, I think about this this research study, and they they um, with college students, and they ask uh, what their favorite foods were, and then they ask what they were, what they ate as children, and what was um, what foods they had, and these kids ate m most all the foods that they were served as children, even when they didn't like them as children, so. I think what we really need to understand is kids go through all different stages. Mm -hmm. Just when you think, oh, wow, this could, then, you know, they get a car and then they're getting fast food. I don't know, whatever. Um, that's a story that, that happened. That it's really the long game and that, mm -hmm. you know, the atmosphere at home and the food exposure really does make a big difference. Even if your kid doesn't eat exactly the way you want them to, um, they're modeling you, they're, um, the research all shows that that they're they're going to end up eating the way you eat. <laughs> so I mean, if you're happy, if you're happy with you know, um, we, I think we get really too invested in these stages. And sure, we should always try and figure out what's going on. Is it normal? Is it just kind of um, do I need to do something that's um, important? But 
but yeah, I think all the research points towards, you know, um, it's just because they didn't eat it that time or it's not their favorite and they eat it sometimes, that's working the magic, just having the food around, having that that positive atmosphere. Not always, you know, we all have our... Some, We're you know, human too. <laughs> yeah. I'm mean, having meal, what? You know, but um, for the most part, you know, meals are enjoyable and, um, you know, just knowing that in the long run, your kids are going to, they're going to eat well for them. And they, you know, we don't have to eat a ton of variety of food. Don't You don't even have to be a foodie. You just, mm -hmm. you know, have to enjoy eating and make some, be able to make some meals for yourself. And um, yeah. So cool. yeah. Thank you game. for that. Yes, I'm totally on board with that. So Marianne and I yeah. together mutually challenge all the parents mm -hmm. to extend your thinking outside the current moment. Give yourself a break. Stay consistent with what you mm -hmm. do offer and have conversations with your kids. Go deep with mm -hmm. them about how they feel, how they think, how food is connected and how food is not the central piece, but just one piece of a really big puzzle of our mm -hmm. overall health and our relationship with our bodies, with our minds, and with other people, ultimately, it all kind of comes into, you know, what we eat even impacts how we interact. Um, well, I, so I think it, that's why the relationship with food because it's so um, important because so many things can impact it, how you feel about your body, your emotions. Not always, not everyone is, someone right. may, may come out in other ways, but since food is so, you know, we eat all, you know, it's something Every we do day. all the time, it's around. So yeah, I think there's, um, you know, a lot of different effects on it, but it comes down to that kind of healthy relationship. Awesome. Yeah. And it all can be done, of course, in the kitchen. Build yeah. those life skills, teaching kids to cook. It was so funny. I didn't even have to ask that question. You, you went there, yeah. went there naturally, but definitely at Kids Cook Real Food, we're all about connecting families in the kitchen, building confidence in parents that their kids can do real tasks, building confidence in the kids that they have, you know, they can really matter to their family and contribute. And that all builds kind of a beautiful cocoon around everything we've been talking about today. So again, thank you, Marianne, for joining us. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for having yeah, me Yeah, and everyone out there, come on back next week for another episode of the Healthy Parenting Connector. See you next time.